is pretty long, so let's begin right away. <clears throat> Please join me in prayer. Lord God, Lord God in heaven, I'm so thankful for this evening, and I'm thankful for these men and these women and these children who have come out tonight to join us, to hear your words of life, to understand a little bit better what's happening in this world and what is still to come. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here with us, uh, not because I doubt that he is. You have promised to be here when we gather like this, but be here in a way that we know and to give us wisdom and anoint our minds. Uh, open us up and be, make us willing to receive what it is that you have given us to receive tonight. I ask that this evening will we'll go to the glory of your name and each one of us will know Jesus a little bit better. We thank you in his name. Amen. <coughs> Okay, so the story of hope begins with a problem, as most good stories do. Now, I personally first discovered this problem when I was only six years old, so this is not a new problem. My family drove by the local newspaper recycling plant, and I was young, so I asked my father, what is recycling? What does that mean? And when he explained to me about the reusing of paper materials, I asked, well, okay, what happens to them if they don't get reused? And his answer was, well, it just goes to the dump. And even at that young age, I then realized something. I realized that we're destroying the world. Now, this is not an ecology seminar. Don't worry. This is just one example of this problem because throughout grade school, and throughout high school, I was given one statistic after another about desertification and deforestation and extinction of species and peak oil, dwindling resources, water shortages, etc., etc., etc. And as I grew up beyond that point, I also learned of nuclear proliferation and decaying and missing warheads from the Soviet Union. I learned about chemical weapons, biological weapons, terrorism. I was a senior in college on September 11th, 2001, and I lived about 500 feet away from ground zero. So you're going to hear some of my eyewitness testimony before we're done. Not tonight, but in our future meetings. After college, I began to understand the business world. Things like insurance fraud and fiscal irresponsibility and Ponzi schemes, money laundering, and the various practices in the securities marketplace that really should be illegal but for some reason aren't. At every single stage of maturity, I kept learning more and more ways that the world was broken and getting worse. Things like preventable cancers, emphysema, factory farming, genetically modified foods, sexually transmitted diseases, advanced interrogation techniques, you remember that? And the like, etc., etc. As a child, my mother forbid me from watching The Simpsons on TV because she was worried that it would do me some sort of moral damage. But today, in 2019, you know that The Simpsons is one of the more mild, harmless things on TV. That, that's the cycle that we have gone through since I was just a little boy. In the 1980s, Brett Easton Ellis shocked the world with his fictional novel, American Psycho, about a businessman driven to madness and serial killings by capitalism and the greed is good culture of the 1980s. Well, today, in real life, scenes right out of that book appear on the nightly news. And not because of copycats, just because of evil. So the extreme fantasy violence of the 1980s has become the real-life violence of today. I mean, do you remember the cannibal killings in Florida a few years back? That stuff is right out of that disgusting book. On January 22nd, 2015, the Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists announced that their doomsday clock had a new setting. It was now three minutes to midnight. Midnight representing the end of humanity. That clock went to two and a half minutes in 2017. 
And as of January 25th of 2018, just over a year ago, we are now at two minutes to midnight. The closest to midnight it has been since, I believe, the 1950s. In case you want to look that up on your own, there is that website, that Wikipedia website, where you can get all sorts of information about the Doomsday Clock and the, the people who put it together. And of course, there's ISIS, the brand new Al-Qaeda. Now, they're not around so much anymore, thank goodness. They appear small, they appear vanquished, but we're really just awaiting the newest manifestation of this terror philosophy. It was Al-Qaeda, then it was ISIS, and it'll be something else next. Of course, there's the ongoing catastrophe in Syria, which is responsible for the greatest refugee disaster and worst humanitarian crisis since World War II, and which is in no small way responsible for the British exit from the European Union. We're going to talk more about that and its impact on Europe in general on Sunday at 5 p.m. So you want to come back for that. Of course, there's the Zika virus responsible for a birth defect near you. Despite being overshadowed by the various political turmoil and other such headlines that grab our attention these days, did you know Zika virus is still a problem? And humanity, you may have noticed this, humanity just kind of generally seems to have gone nuts recently. Nothing means anything anymore. Do you remember when words used to mean something? And now I feel like we're just making up words or making up meanings to old words. Just think about your favorite hot button political issue, whatever it is, and then consider whether or not that was such a huge issue just 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. I could elaborate, but I don't want to start the story with a hot button politic thing. You know, I don't want to get us off on a political foot because that's not what this is about. But needless to say, the world seems very different than it was even just a decade ago, and certainly since I was young. So much so is it different that we can't even tell good from evil sometimes, even as evil is staring us right in the face. Friends, our world is broken. It's broken. And it seems like we are heading for disaster. Even with a decent economy and relative peace in the world right now, everywhere feels like it's hunkering down for a fight. Have you noticed that? Our president gets a lot of slack for that, but he is not the only one. Worldwide, governments are adopting that same kind of fighting attitude, like they're waiting for something big. Everyone seems to feel that a crisis is coming, even if they can't explain why it seems that way. So I, I used to, I've been in this game for a little while, and I used to have to work hard to convince people of what I am telling you, but for the past few years, the news has been doing all of that work for me. And it's just not so hard to convince people of these things anymore. It's increasingly hard to deny that things are bad. And in these days of fake news, so to speak, there appears to no longer be even an objective reality that we can all agree on. People end up choosing their facts based on their existing worldviews instead of making their worldviews based on objective facts. And then we wonder why we can't get along. The story of hope acknowledges all of this. It acknowledges this problem. And it admits that the world is broken, and it tells us why, and it tells us how it became that way. But it also tells us what it all means, where it's all going, and the hopeful conclusion to all of it, and how we can be part of it. It tells us about a promise from heaven that has dazzled the minds of the greatest thinkers in history throughout time, and which, happily for us, is available to everyone who wants it, even you. The story of hope began long, long ago, but it ends future tense, even in our future from this day. In other words, friends, 
Our world today is catching up to an ending that was written a long time ago. It was written in ancient times. So we're going to start at the beginning so that we can properly understand the end which is to come. We're going to look at the past to see how it informs the present and what it tells us about the future. And actually for tonight, we're going to start even before the beginning. The story of hope is written in a narrative form and it's going to follow roughly a three act narrative structure. So before the beginning would be the precipitating event of the story of hope. It is the event without which none of the rest of the story would occur. So tonight we seek to answer a question that I know everyone has struggled with at one time or another. It's kind of a universal human question. Even I have struggled with this. It is the question of why do bad things happen? Why? W what's going on that causes all of the things that we've already talked about? Why is it so bad? Now this question takes many forms, of course, such as if God is so good like you say, then why is the world so bad? Sometimes it comes out as, why do children suffer? Why do good people suffer? Why do innocents suffer? Sometimes it's more specific. Where was God when such and such tragedy took place? Where was God on September 11, 2001? Where was God during the Holocaust? Where was God when my family suffered this loss? At its most basic, this question about badness recognizes that death and torment and the things of this world are inherently not good. We evaluate our concept of goodness and all of this is not included in it. And so what we're really asking is, where did this badness come from and why is it here? Now, I think that's a pretty fundamental human question that everyone wrestles with at one time or another, but despite the, the quasi-universal nature of this, of this question, did you know you don't generally find an answer for it? Even in churches, where you kind of think you would find an answer for a question like that. And when you do find an answer, when you're lucky enough to have a group of believers that is able to give you some sort of answer, that answer generally takes a form of, well, you know, um, God has a plan. God is in charge. Which sounds good and is true. But as a young person, that wasn't enough for me. That was a pseudo non-answer and I wanted more. And I found that lots of people want more than that. After a while, I figured that there simply were no answers since nobody had them. And I ended up leaving the various churches where I had been trying to find this answer. All of them. I left them all. I had been members of several churches. I had attended several more. I was a seeker. I wanted answers. And no more after that. If you weren't going to tell me what I needed, I had no more time for you. And the world became my church. If everything was falling apart, I figured, if there was no meaning to any of this, no reason why these things occurred, then you know what? I might as well just go enjoy it while it lasted. And that was my mentality. And I think that's a lot of people's mentality, increasingly so as time goes on. That's exactly what I did. That's exactly what many others have done and continue to do. But one day, God brought me someone who had an actual answer. That answer came from the Bible and it changed absolutely everything about my life from that point on. The story of hope is not about me individually, but we will get to know each other as the nights and the weeks go on here as I share some of my testimony with you and hear from you in the downtime outside of, of sermon time. We're going to illustrate some of the story of hope through my experiences, even though it's not really about me because the story of hope is the story of every believer, including you. Where did badness come from? What is the answer that we're missing here? The Bible says the badness comes, are you ready for this? From heaven. For real. Our first scripture is going to be Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And war broke out 
in heaven. It says it right there in black and white in the Bible. In fact, in three different books of the Bible, this heavenly war is described to us. Revelation is just one of them. Christ himself discusses it in the Gospels, and the Bible is clear when you put it all together. Evil began in heaven, and it came here afterward. So if we're going back to the beginning, we have to figure out heaven. We've got to start there. What is heaven? Well, contrary to the depictions given by many religious institutions, by the popular media, certainly the movies of today, heaven is actually a lively place and an active place where specific things happen according to specific rules. Here are some principles of heaven that help us better understand it. Okay? From Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. So heaven is a place with no death. Sounds nice, doesn't it? It's a place where lions play and rest with the animals they would just kill and eat in this world. Where children have dominions over the great beasts without harm. Verses 8 and 9. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. And this is God speaking. My God's holy mountain. Heaven is a place where the deadliest of serpents has no venom, even for the most helpless of humans. Where nothing is harmed and nothing is destroyed. Where everything is holy. Where life is precious. It's exactly the kind of place that you would think a perfect God of love would create. It's a place of harmony and peace with no worry and no fear. And the Bible tells us of creatures that live there, calls them angels. Now that word angel means messenger, so these are divine creatures that carry out the will of God. Now we know from the Bible that there are more than one kind of these creatures and that they are very beautiful. Consider the description of one such angel that we find in Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning in verse 12. It says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. So these are dazzling creatures that our minds cannot fully understand. The, the best we can do is describe them as if they're dressed in jewelry. We can't really comprehend them, but we know that they have no blessing from God that is withheld from them. They are powerful, they're intelligent, and they're free. So these verses above me here from Ezekiel 28, they describe one of these creatures in particular. It describes the most powerful one. The one who was king over the universe and second to none except God himself. The Bible calls this creature a number of things such as Lucifer, Isaiah 14, 12. Satan, Luke 10, 18, amongst many others. The devil, Matthew 4, 1, again among many other examples. The serpent, Genesis 3, 1, and a handful of others as well. He is the arch enemy of good. He is the embodiment of all things that are not God. And yet, this is, this is where it gets a little interesting. The Bible tells us that he was not always evil. He was, as we've already read, the seal of perfection, Ezekiel 28, 12. The devil, the seal of perfection. So that means God did not create him evil. Something went wrong. Now, verse 14 of this same chapter tells us that this creature, Lucifer, once ministered at the very throne of of God. It uses some confusing language that we're going to explore in a couple days, but it, that's what it tells us, that he ministered at the very throne of God. 
He had a closeness to the Almighty that no other created being could possibly have. But despite this, we learn in verse 15 that you were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until till iniquity was found in you. So Lucifer's heart turned sour. Evil sprang forth from within. The word iniquity is a fancy word for sin, and wouldn't you know it, the Bible defines sin for us. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, sin is defined as lawlessness, or in the original King James, the transgression of the law. So sin, then, is what happens when God's law is broken. And it's more like a disease than an action. It's, it's not so much the sinful action that you take, it's the condition that is created as a result of that action. It's like it, it creates an environment of lawlessness, and it's contagious, like a disease. It's infectious. So the Bible tells us that Lucifer was perfect in every way until he broke the law of God in his heart. Right? It was found in him. We read that. So back to Ezekiel 28, verse 17. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So specifically, we're learning that Lucifer became full of himself. He caught his own reflection one too many times, and you know, he really, really liked what he saw in the mirror. Now this was problematic, because the law of God specifically states, You shall have no other gods before me, God. That's Exodus 20, verse 3. So as long as everyone in the universe keeps God as priority number one, then there's going to be peace throughout the universe. But Lucifer put himself in the place of God. He started to believe that his beauty and his majesty came not from without, not from God, but instead from within. And as a result, he stopped giving homage to his creator. Isaiah 14 is the third place we find the, this war described to us. Speaking again of Lucifer, You have said in your heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He got tired of thanking God for what he believed was rightfully and inherently his own. And he declared himself superior to the other angels and all of the rest of creation. And ultimately, verse 14, he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So Lucifer had a bit of an I problem. I will do this. I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. And he decided that he could run the universe better than God. See, Lucifer didn't like the rules. He wanted to be his own God, but we saw already how the law demands that God alone be treated as God. So Lucifer desired a position in the kingdom that was not his to take, but that's problematic also because God's law says, you shall not covet. Don't want what God doesn't give you. Exodus 20, 17. So Lucifer then desired to steal God's throne, but the law plainly says, you shall not steal. Exodus 20:15. So God's law was too restrictive for Lucifer. It didn't allow him to, w to live the way that he wanted to, but he had a problem. The problem is that the law also demands death for the transgressor. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6:23. So if Lucifer wanted to pursue his course of rebellion, he had to overcome the penalty of his rebellion first. And how would he do that? The Bible tells us that he did that by convincing others to turn on God as well. By showing what he was trying to do was to show God that his creatures could not live under God's law and would no longer accept it. So now, imagine heaven. we got to put on our sanctified imaginations here. Imagine heaven, a place where lying doesn't exist. You don't even have vocabulary to describe lying because it doesn't exist. The concept is foreign. Everyone there tells the truth because, well, duh, that's the only choice. <laughs> of course everyone tells the truth. 
Why wouldn't you do that? That's the, that's the only thing you can do. If you're in such a place and someone came up to you and said, you know, I've been thinking and I've decided that God is not very fair. I mean, just think about it. Think about all the other things that we could be doing if we didn't have to serve him all the time. What would you do? What would you think? You've never been confronted by a situation like this before. You've literally never considered God as being unfair before. It's never crossed your mind that there could be a, a way to exist outside of God's instructions. And then here's Lucifer, the most powerful created being in the universe, the one who is full of wisdom and perfect in beauty the ultimate created authority and he is telling you that he had a better way. What would you say? Well, the Bible tells us in Revelation 12, starting in verse 3, that fully one-third of heaven's angels fell for Lucifer's deception. One-third of infinity. That's a big number. On your way out, you're going to have a, uh, a handout for tonight. It is a description of various symbols that we find throughout the Bible and specifically in Revelation chapter 12 so that you, if you want to, can go home, study out Revelation 12. Uh, it describes the war in heaven and you can use this little cheat sheet to understand the symbols a little better. It tells you where to go in the Bible to find the definition of these symbols. So make sure you get that on your way out. But, okay, if one-third of heaven's angels sided with Lucifer... That, that's bad news, but it comes with some good news because it means that two-thirds of the angels did not. Now, what happens when a liar gets found out? Hmm? <laughs> when the liar meets resistance to his lies, what does he do? Well, he can, he can do the right thing and repent and come clean. But if that's not what the liar chooses to do, then he really only has two choices. He has to ratchet up the lies and double down on the deception or he has to get rid of the obstacle, right? The, the one who is resisting the lies or I guess he could do both and it seems that Lucifer did both. Ezekiel 28 again, verse 16. By the abundance of your trading, speaking of Lucifer, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Now, there is no money in heaven. So trading here would be trading, like I've already described it to you, the secrets and the lies, trading ideas by the abundance of all those whispers you were doing. You became filled with violence. When magnifying the lies didn't work, it says very plainly, violence occurred, and therefore, war broke out in heaven. Revelation 12, 7. The end result of this war is in verse 9. It says, So the great dragon was cast out of heaven, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And so here we get a picture of why violence exists at all. It was born somewhere else, and then it came here. And this, cru this creature, Lucifer, or Satan, right? After the after a heavenly war, he gets this new name, Satan, which means adversary. He was the first one ever to sin in any way. He invented all forms of badness and rebellion. That means it originated with him. That's why Jesus calls him the father of lies <laughs> in, in the Gospel of John. No one taught him how to lie. He invented it. So all of this originated with him, and that means it did not originate with God. Not with God, but with an enemy, one who is opposed to God. With God, no one and nothing ever died. But with the enemy, death reigns supreme. And now that enemy is here the most powerful of all created beings, 
the most powerful next to only God himself is here running amok with an infinite number of fallen angels running around also. They're not interested in following any sort of rules. So, you know, I hear people ask me frequently, one-on-one -on -one or in seminars like this, they say, why do bad things happen? But I think that's the wrong answer. I mean, wrong question, sorry. I think that's the wrong question. Because the Bible tells me about a world that is largely cut off from God. It's inhabited by these incredibly powerful forces of evil whose purpose it is to recreate the government of the universe in Satan's image. Satan's image rather than God's. So the Bible makes me ask a totally different question. I read the Bible and I say, why does anything good ever happen here at all? I think it is a testimony to the goodness and the power of the Almighty God that He reaches down through the darkness of sin and commands control over this world anyway. Because nothing good should ever happen here. From a biblical perspective, we see that Earth is the sweaty armpit of the universe. No one visits here. This is where all the badness exists. This whole planet is one great big grave. Rebellion began in heaven, friends. But it came here. And we're going to discuss specifically how it came here and how we got involved in this cosmic war in rather great detail tomorrow. Specifically at 7, a little bit at 5. So come on back tomorrow. We will elaborate on this message tonight. We're also going to discuss what the Bible says is the solution to this eternal conflict that is all around us. The divine hope that we can have that things will not always be this way. So please come back tomorrow. This will say on your schedule, but I'll decode it for you. We're having a meeting at 5 o'clock tomorrow. Then we're going to serve you dinner for free. And then we have another meeting at 7. So please mark your calendars and come on back. So the Bible tells us, luckily for us, that God was not content to leave this planet in its broken condition. Though man deserves no attention and no mercy from the divine creator of all things, the mystery in the Bible is that God does, in fact, care for us. He reaches down from eternal divinity above into our little cesspool planet of death, and he talks to us. Psalm 8.4 records the psalmist wondering, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? You see, this mystery of God loving us anyway has dazzled the minds of believers for a very long time. Psalm 8.4 was written about 1000 BC. Why would God reach down to us? Why would he guide us? Why would he teach us? Ultimately, why would he become one of us in the person of Jesus Christ and then allow us to beat him and kill him in the most humiliating and terrible way that we could imagine to do so. Why? Why would he do that only then to return from the dead with an offer of eternal life in paradise at no cost except faith? Why? Why would God do that? What would he hope to gain by pursuing us so relentlessly and giving to us so freely and so liberally? Why? Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, he hoped to gain you. And it's not any more complicated than that. He hoped to gain you and me and you and you and you and you in the back and all of us. Sin requires death, as we've seen. Well, how many sinners are there in this world? What would you guess? Romans 3.23, all have sinned 
and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us is in this game together. No one of us is exempt from this death sentence that we're under. No one is immune, not you, not me. Satan's accusation has been that the law is too rigid. The penalty for transgression is too great. The whole thing is unfair. So how can God satisfy the claims of his divine law, which means the death of the sinner, while at the same time extending eternal life to the human sinners like you and me at the same time? How can he do both of those things at the same time? And the answer is Jesus Christ, who came to receive our death on our behalf. John 3.16, perhaps the most famous scripture in the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, you can't get to heaven the way you are right now. Did you know that? None of us can, but through Jesus Christ, we can all vicariously experience the death that sin requires and inherit eternal life for free instead. And I don't know about you, friends, but I find so much hope in that message. So much. Because the Bible tells me all of this conflict and all of this struggle and all of this evil is not about you and me. This is an eternal conflict between God and Satan, good and evil, the Lord and the devil. We're not responsible to win this war. It's between them. So we have to ask, all right, okay, then how do we fit into this war? What's our role? The Bible says that we are the evidence to a watching universe. Consider 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. The scripture up there is from the New International Version. For it seems to me that God has put us on display. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe. In Greek, that word is cosmos. To the angels as well as to human beings. So, to, so think about this. Why are we on display? What, what's, what's the purpose of that? Two-thirds of heaven's angels remained loyal to God, but why did they do that? Did they know for sure that they made the right choice? As humanity subsequently pledged its loyalty to Lucifer, did the loyal angels wonder if Lucifer was going to win? What about, mathematically speaking, probability speaking, there's got to be other life out there somewhere. If so, God would be the God of that world too, so would those creatures wonder about sin? as they're watching it unfold down here? Do they look on the things that we do? They look on our sex and our partying and our passions and our money and our luxury and all the various <laughs> trappings of humanity, right? Do they wonder if maybe Lucifer might have had a good idea? I mean, maybe a little bit of death isn't such a bad thing if we get to live like the humans do. The only way the universe can decide who should rightfully be God is to see what the end result of this rebellion is and then choose for themselves. But it's important to know the heavenly war is not between people. The Bible says in Ephesians 6.12 very plainly that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, against the re rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So that means there is a largely unseen world at work all around us all the time. It is influencing us, it is protecting us, it's also misleading us depending on who we're listening to, right? Swaying our hearts and minds towards eternity with God or towards death without God. And because the real enemy is the devil and his demons, that means there is no human enemy. And I'm going to say that again and let it sink in. There is no human enemy. 
All of us are in need of God. Amen? All of us. None more so or less so than others. We're all in this same boat together because there's no human enemy and there's no evil person. But there's certainly evil in this world, isn't there? And people do evil things all the time. In fact, the Bible even reveals evil to us in places that we might not otherwise think to consider. And this is kind of a hint as to what's coming. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. Consider this. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. In other words, talking about people who are led away from God in the name of God. And placing the name Jesus on the devil doesn't actually make it Jesus. Right? Same chapter, verses 14 and 15. No wonder! For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. The Bible plainly teaches that not everything called Jesus is automatically Christian. And this is why I'm sending you home with a list of all the scriptures every single night so you can open up your Bible and test what you hear here against the word of God. The devil performs his deceptions masquerading as Jesus to the destruction of many. And I will illustrate that with perhaps the three most terrifying scriptures in the whole Bible, at least to me. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, words of Jesus. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, I don't know of a stronger warning than this. We have to make sure that our ideas about Jesus are correct ideas about Jesus. We have to make sure that we are seeking after the real Jesus rather than seeking after Satan using Christ's name. And how do we do that? We do it the way that Jesus says to do it. John chapter 5, verse 39, he says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life. And these, the scriptures, are they which testify of me. We make sure that our ideas are correct by checking every single thing that we say against the scriptures. That's the only way to do it. And that's what we will be doing here all throughout the story of hope. I pledge to you that the Bible will be our roadmap. It will be our anchor. We're going to preach from this book almost exclusively. I say almost because we will look at historical events. We'll look at even current events. We'll stray from the Bible here and there, but we'll do so always with an eye to the Bible so that whatever else we're looking at will be informed by the scriptures and this will stay our rock. Amen? <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so friends, this heavenly war is waged here on earth and it affects every single thing that we do. As we've seen, even the name of Jesus has been hijacked and misused by the enemy. And unfortunately, many will follow Satan to their doom. Hopefully no one in this room, amen? Although God will reject none, exactly none, who come to him in faith, clearly there are many in the world who do not come and who will not come. Do you know how many invitations we sent around Madeira? A whole lot more than the people who are in this room right now. For most people, this is simply not a priority. 
kind of breaks my heart a little bit. There are many who will not come. Many who reject God. Many who side with Lucifer's philosophies more so than Christ's, even while using the name of Christ. And as the people on earth choose sides, the heavenly war plays itself out through the events on planet earth. What all of this means is that things happen here on earth because they first happened in heaven. There is war on earth because there was first war in heaven. False religionists misrepresent Christ on earth because Satan first misrepresented him in heaven. And as the heavenly war escalates to its climax, the earth follows suit. Now, if you're familiar at all with your Bible, with Revelation or with some of the chapters in the Gospels, you will know already that Christ promises some really kind of insanely difficult times on earth at the very end of history prior to his return. As one example, Matthew 24, 21, Jesus says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So we have to ask, why would God do that? Why would God ordain this? Have mercy. What's this all about? And the answer is simple. It is only when the restraining hand of God is fully removed, when sin runs rampant and the wisdom of God is completely overrun by the folly of man, when evil threatens to extinguish good forever, even as Lucifer sought to extinguish God. When the essence of human life seems about to perish, as Jesus says in the very next verse, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then, and only then, in that circumstance, can the watching angels and the unfallen worlds see for themselves that Lucifer, behind his demeanor of fairness and equality and freedom, really is only offering his followers death. And when the universe understands that for itself, of its own free will, when they get that the wages of sin is death, well, then the war is over. There is no more reason to permit this any longer. And we will see, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and onwards, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And as the dead in Christ, or, and, as, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. The return of Jesus Christ. The eternal promise fulfilled. The end of all of this chaos. The great resurrection of the dead. And the great translation of the living. The ultimate justice for all who suffered in this world and longed in their hearts for a better world. This will be the destruction of sin and the renewal of all things forever. Friends, eternal life for everyone who chooses it. An eternal kingdom without sin. We call it heaven. An eternal kingdom for those who are tired of a world where everything dies. Friends, I'm inviting you tonight to choose life. I know I know that this story can seem like madness to a naturalistic mind. I know that because I used to have a naturalistic mind. And I used to think stuff like this was madness. But I'm inviting you tonight to open up your mind a little bit and to just to consider that the supernatural world might in fact be real. Also that the Bible might have a thing or two to say about that supernatural world. And as we, as, as we explore what the Bible says about that world and we ground it all in the scriptures, 
we're going to have questions. I hope you have questions, and I invite you to bring those questions, okay? Starting tomorrow, we're going to have a box where you can put your questions, <laughs> and uh, you drop it in there, and I will do my best to address your questions from up here before the beginning of uh, an appropriate message where we can give you a full answer. We're going to explore this out together, right? We're under this curse together. We're looking forward to the Redeemer together, and we're going to be on this journey together throughout the story of hope. The heavenly war is of such vital importance, and I mean that, like eternal life and eternal death kind of importance, that you owe it to yourselves to bring your questions and to study out the sheets I give you and to do your homework to make sure that the story of hope is Bible truth. Let me make you a promise. If you come, if you listen, if you internalize, if you respond to Jesus the way I believe he will call you to respond, your life is going to be different in a month. He's going to grab you and he's not going to let go. And he's going to lead you into things you never even understood were possible. That's the promise of Jesus that I'm extending to you tonight. Not because I am Jesus, but because I know him. And he's after every single one of us in the same way. Now, life on earth presents many questions. And I honestly believe in my heart that the Bible's heavenly war narrative that we've just gone through is the best explanation for all of them. I believe it informs and contextualizes everything in the world. And I dare say, you might just agree with me by the time we're done. The story of hope is rather compelling because it's the story of God and the story of Christ. Here's the summary. We're going to look at many important details, but it all boils down to this. Things are bad, and they're going to get worse. However, God is fixing it. And when he's done fixing it, it will be fixed forever. So God is fighting a war that has nothing to do with us, and yet we are a crucial part of it anyway. And the good news tonight is that God wins this war. And he tells us how he wins it in the pages of his word, the Bible. He tells us everything we need to know. And God is so gracious and so generous that he extends his victory to everybody who wants it. So you can participate in the victory also. He charges you nothing but he gives you everything. And all you have to do is tell him that you want what he's giving. It's not easy. Tell him tonight that you want to be on his side today and every single day until he comes back to put an end to this mess and bring us home where we belong. There's no one here tonight who cannot come to Jesus and gain eternal life even if you think that can't possibly apply to you. There's no one here who cannot come to Jesus. There is no one here who is exempt or excluded from God's kingdom unless you desire to exclude yourself. If you're not there, it'll be your choice not to be there, not Christ's. And so tonight, I'm going to make it really easy for you to decide, okay? Everyone who wants to be on the winning side of history... That means God's side of history and receive the kingdom that he has in store for those who choose him. Just show God by raising your hands tonight. Who wants to be in that winning team? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm going to pray now that God will seal the decisions that you just made and that you showed him with that raised hand. And then after prayer, I have just a little bit more to tell you, so hang out, sit tight for another couple minutes, and then we'll dismiss for the night. But now let's pray. <laughs> so much. Thank you for telling us about this heavenly war, a spiritual world that we cannot see. It's us every day, whether we realize. Lord, we want to be on your side. We want to be called by you on that day that you appear in the clouds of heaven. We want to hear you call our names and we want to rise to everlasting life with you. Lord, help us to believe these things 
and seal the decisions that were made tonight. Seal our hearts and seal our minds. Disallow the forces of darkness to come and change our minds. And Lord, if anyone here is struggling, I pray that you will pay special attention to that man or that woman. And you will give him or her exactly what they need to be at peace and to see you for who you really are. Lord, I pray for these, for these men and women. I pray for my friends who have come out here tonight. I ask you to remember them, seal them, draw them near to you. And as we part from this place, keep us all safe as we return to our homes and bring us back here tomorrow to learn more about this incredible story and our incredible Savior. Thank you so much. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> okay, like I said, don't go. Just two more.